for coming out. It's a little dreary, it's a little cold. They've gotten a taste of, of winter once again, but we're, we're Minnesotans and we're used to it, right? Um, so, welcome. I'm Erica Lee, I'm Director of the Immigration History Research Center, which is upstairs along with our partner, the Immigration History Research Center Archives. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight. So tonight's really special because this is our kickoff event. Our kickoff event for, I should hold up one of the postcards, for Global Minnesota Immigrants Past and Present. And this is um, an NEH funded, a National Endowment for the Humanities funded project. It's part of their uh, new program on humanities in the public square and also their common good initiative. And the, the goal of these programs is to really bring humanities into public conversation, to bring it out into uh, the public, into um, town halls, into common spaces, and to help foster innovative ways to bring scholarship together um, to relevant contemporary issues. This is the first year of the program, and the IHRC is just one of 21 institutions nationwide that received this grant, so we're really um, excited about it. And of course we chose this topic, immigration, not only because this is what we do and this is what we've been doing for 50 years, but also because obviously it's one of the most significant issues shaping contemporary America. And we found that places like Minnesota are at the forefront of these discussions. So like many other states in the United States, Minnesota is a place of both old and new immigration. It's, um, we, we sometimes forget this because we think that immigration is only a new thing, but uh, at the turn of the century, 40% of Minnesota's population was actually foreign born. And this was much higher than the national average, which was around 11%. And of course, at that time, most immigrants in Minnesota were from Germany and Norway and Sweden. And today is quite different. The U.S. is experiencing high rates of immigration generally, and Minnesota is unique and a particularly important site to study this new immigration. So our county, Hennepin County, for example, was officially designated a new Ellis Island. This happened around 2000 or so. Uh, demographers pointed out that we experienced significant increases in immigration during the decade between 1990 up through 2010, and that the percentage of foreign-born residents in Minnesota has risen faster than the national average. Immigration patterns have shifted away from Europe in the 19th, early 20th century, and more towards Asia and Latin America and Africa. And of course, this is a nationwide uh, pattern, but we see it especially here in Minneapolis and St. Paul, right over the border of campus into Cedar Riverside. And we can see this happening, uh, but we, we don't perhaps know the, the exact numbers. And when I share this with you, um, I think you'll be as surprised as I was when I read it. The number of African immigrants and refugees grew by 620% in recent decades. The Latino population grew by 577%. And of course, with 11 American Indian nations in Minnesota, the intersections between this new immigration and indigenous issues, both in the past and present, are especially important. So we found that in Minnesota, much like the rest of America, public dialogue and immigration is sorely needed. Too often, our immigration history, often perceived through romanticized notions of how immigration worked in the past, how it was pioneers who came to an empty wilderness and remade the land, how those immigrants came in the right way, they wanted to become American and achieve the American dream. So much of that romanticized immigration history is disconnected from today. And our current debates about immigration often pit older immigrant groups against new ones. So the purpose of our project here is to ask what really connects the immigrant experience across time and place, and how might we explain those differences as well as similarities. So our public forums, and tonight is one of our public forums, uh, like tonight's immigrant groups, 
These programs are designed to engage you, our diverse audience, in conversation about these questions. Our next public forum is happening in two weeks, two weeks exactly from tonight, and it's called Seeking Refuge, Minnesota and the Refugee Experience. And it's going to be happening just across the way in Willie Hall. We're going to explore Minnesota's unique history as a place of resettlement for refugees from Africa, from Europe, and from Asia. And we're going to consider the state's role in the contemporary global refugee crisis today. We'll also celebrate the book launch of award-winning author, Kalia Yang, and her new book, The Song Poet. It's not, um, it, the official publication date is sometime in May. We get to launch it here a couple weeks ahead of that, um, and we're really excited about that. We also have a range of public programs that partner with community, cultural, and educational institutions to continue these conversations on a smaller scale and to create educational resources. So for example, we've organized neighborhood walking tours with Peter Ratcliffe's Eastside Freedom Library. We've organized spoken word workshops, film screenings, and also discussions. We're going to continue working with immigrants and refugees to create their own digital stories about immigration that will become part of our Immigrant Stories collection. So if you saw these cards out at the reception and also on the back table, these are just two of the stories that we've created out of over 160 that are in the collection. Um, some of these are students from the University of Minnesota. Some of these are staff members here at the IHRC. I always have to hold this one up because this is <laughs> saying Rats about story. And he's one of the major organizers of the event tonight. And he was really cute as a four-year-old. <laughs> And as part of our Immigrant Stories project, we're creating a digital storytelling app that will allow anyone, anywhere, to create, preserve, and share their immigrant story. We're also holding, for any of you teachers out there, we're holding a summer institute on, um, for educators on migration and digital storytelling. So we hope that you'll join us for these future uh, events and also conversations. We hope that together we can start a real dialogue about immigration past and present. And if you haven't done so already, please sign up for our mailing list. Find us on Facebook. And also, please fill out the survey that's on your chairs um, after, the, after the event. So tonight, we're going to kick off this project. And we're going to do it with two very, very special guests and friends of the ITRC. The first is Megan Marsnik. She's the granddaughter of Slovenian immigrants and the daughter of union activists. She was born and raised in the Wabic, a small town on Minnesota's Iron Range, settled primarily by Eastern European and Scandinavian immigrants. She has degrees in English, education, and gender studies. She earned her MFA in writing and poetics from Naropa University in Boulder. She won the Jack Kerouac Award for Outstanding Prose there. And now she teaches English and philosophy at Southwest High School. She may have my son eventually in her class, so I'll, we'll keep in touch. Her book, um, Underground, is available for purchase at the Star Tribune website. And joining her in conversation is Peter Ratcliffe, Professor Emeritus of History at McAllister College. He specializes in US labor, immigration, and African American history. He's co-founder of the Eastside Freedom Library in St. Paul, which is dedicated to preserving and promoting knowledge about the people and history of the East Side through educational collections, programs, and storytelling. And I think, um, I'm just looking for the, this is it. This program that is on the back table, Worker Rights and Wrongs from Untold Stories, Labor History Series, uh, sponsored by the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library. Many of the events are happening at the Eastside Freedom Library, including a, another talk Washington. with Megan at the Arlington Hills Library. No. Yeah. At, at the Eastside Freedom Library. No, she's at Arlington Hills. You're at Arlington. Three blocks away. Okay. So in, a, in about a couple weeks or in a month or so. So please help me in welcoming to campus and thanking Peter and, Mar and Megan for helping us kick off this event uh, to the Global Minnesota Program. And thank you again for coming. Thank you. 
This is a really big room. I wish I had a room this big when I'm teaching. Be outstanding. If anybody wants to move in, make it feel more homey, feel free to move around. Um, this is what is going to happen as I see it. How's my volume? Everything all right? Okay. Um, I'm going to talk for like a minute or two, and then I'm going to read from my novel, um, Underground. Um, some of you may have read it in the Star Tribune. Uh, it was serialized last summer. Um, some of you perhaps uh, purchased it and read it online. Um, so I'm going I'm to read a few sections on that from the very beginning of the book, which I don't usually do, but it is the section um, where we talk about the immigrant journey. So we'll do that. Um, I would like to thank Erica and Singh for inviting me. Um, this topic is very near and, and dear to my heart. I am many things. I, I am a mother. My daughter's here, Maddie, and a teacher. Um, I'm a rower. There are lots of aspects to my identity, but perhaps one of the most strongest aspects of my identity is that I am an Iron Ranger. Um, I think there might be a couple more here, <laughs> just in case. Um, it's almost impossible for me to explain what it means to be an Iron Ranger to someone who isn't one. And it has never been necessary for me to explain it to someone who is. Um, Minnesota Brown, who is a writer in northern Minnesota, he had this great quote. Um, he said, the Iron Range is one part geography and one part attitude. I liked that. Um, what is it that makes people identify so strongly with northern Minnesota and being an Iron Ranger? We identify with our own ethnicity. When, when I was growing up, a very common question that we would ask each other if a new kid came into the class, one of the first things you would say is, what are you? If you are an Iron Ranger, you know how to answer that question. You say, I'm half Slovenian and half Irish. I'm German. I'm a quarter Ojibwe. This is how we would introduce ourselves because our identity was so connected to our parents and our grandparents and our ethnic roots. And even though my background may be different from another Iron Ranger, we were bonded by this fact that we all defined ourselves by our connections to the old country. It is a place where people do not forget their past, where they hold on to the traditions and the languages to varying degrees, the Finns probably more than any, um, and we carry it forward and we teach our children to value where they come from and let that shape who you are. So I can't explain what it means to be an Iron Ranger, but I just tried. And I made a longer effort by writing a book about the Iron Range. I, I am a teacher, and I, I love my job, because my job is to put stories in the hands of children. And my classroom is very multicultural. So I have many students from different countries who speak different languages different faith backgrounds, and the discussions are fascinating. And people think, oh, you're from the Iron Range, this must be really weird. No, it's exactly what I grew up with. People from different backgrounds with different ethnicities and different languages having conversations and trying to make the world a better place. So it's very familiar to me to teach in an inner city and be able to invite different perspectives and how much more we can learn um, that way. I think that stories have the power to change the world. If you're a dancer or an artist, you, you probably have, have your genre. But for me, it's stories. Uh, kids relate to stories, and what it does is it reminds us, it doesn't say, oh, now I know what it means to be Hmong, because I read The Late Homecomer. What you learn from a story is, I'm human. I 
I'm a human being, and even though I have nothing in common with this protagonist, I felt her sorrow, or I felt her grief, or I felt her joy. And I think what we need to do is remember that we are all human beings, and that's how immigrant history can be connected to contemporary cultures. We have to remember, if we're not indigenous, we came from somewhere else, willingly perhaps, unwillingly, if we were on the slave ship. So, I actually wrote down this question because I wanted to remember. How is it possible to oppress entire populations of people? This has happened time and time again. How is it possible to say, my grandfather, who emigrated from Slovenia in 1907, deserved a home, a decent wage, freedom from ethnic and religious discrimination. But these people over here who just got here, which may be 50 years, like a Syrian refugee perhaps, or a migrant worker, they don't deserve that. The only way we can come to that conclusion is to decide that we're not connected by our humanity. So I have an immigrant story, and I'm going to share it with you. And it wasn't my objective. I had lots of objectives. But I think it, it would be very, very nice when people relate to this immigrant story and they say, oh, that's just like my grandma's story. That we can also make the connection and say, what other people in Minnesota right now are going through the similar kind of thing? Being discriminated against. You look at me, I'm a white woman. My grandmother was a white woman. She had an accent. You get judged by how you look, you get judged by how you talk. Right now, I, don't, I have an Iron Range accent, I'm proud of it. But I don't have an accent that immediately marks me as somebody who has come from another country. So therefore, I get to have all of the advantages of white privilege, right? OK? So what we need to do is remember, if you came from an ancestral background like I did, remember what our grandparents went through and then apply it. Apply it to today, to the immigrant communities that are today, and, and remember our humanity and remember to be kind and loving and treat everybody like our brother or our sister. Okay, so now I'm gonna read. And then I'm gonna talk to Peter, who's one of my favorites. Um, usually I talk about labor activism, which, cause that's my favorite topic in the entire world. Um, and my book is uh, written based on a true story that happened almost 100 years ago. In June, 100 years ago, there was a labor uprising that was um, begun by an immigrant population. People who, a lot of people didn't think they had any power at all, and they found that when they banded together, they had enough power to shut down U.S. Steel and wage perhaps the greatest labor strike that had happened, and it inspired all kinds of other um, movements to get people dignity in their work. Okay, so I'm going to read a little bit from the beginning, which I hardly ever do, so I get to read the epigraph, which no one ever gets to see, and I always wanted them to. So here's the epigraph. The woman holds up three corners of the house. Slovenian proverb. For my father, Bernard Fuzzy Marsnik, who always fought for the underdog and for Iron Range women. Raise your hand if you're one of those. This is for you! Okay, all right. <laughs> Chapter one. There was plenty of dust, plenty of whiskey, plenty of red earth, rock, and forest. There were not enough women, so they were sent for. The women came from many countries, Italy, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Croatia, and Slovenia. Most traveled alone, but some dragged along small children or nursing babies. The lucky ones, 
had been sent for by their husbands, who had been living in the iron mining community for a year, perhaps more. They had someone to greet them when they arrived. The least lucky were sent for by the brothel owners. Their passages out of the old country were paid in exchange for a year of service. Most of these immigrant women thought they would be tending bar, serving pints to the exhausted miners and lumberjacks. When they arrived, they quickly learned that other services were expected. They had no money and could not turn back. 16-year-old Katka Kovic did not fall into any of the usual categories. Her parents died on March 30th and April 7th, 1915, both from cholera. Five weeks later, a young man with unruly black curls and a thick mustache arrived at the tiny cottage where she lived, suddenly alone, at the foot of the mountains in the small village of Zorovnica, Slovenia. No one had visited in weeks and her long brown hair was shamefully unbraided. A few unwashed strands blew in wisps across her sunburned face, suggesting an innate wildness about her. Her skinny body was covered with an old torn frock that had once belonged to her dead mother. The elders from town told her to burn all of her parents' clothing, but she had been wearing this garment for days and she had not become remotely sick. Paul Schmidt, the young man at her door said, bowing politely. So sorry to hear about your ma and your ata. I had people too who caught the fever. Katka put her hands in the pocket of her apron. Paul Schmidt peered at her curiously. Here, Paul said. He fumbled around in his coat pocket until he found what he was looking for. He thrust a letter into her hands. The same message was written twice, once in Slovenian and once in English. Dear niece, words cannot express my sorrow. My wife and I are prepared to offer you a home in the town of Biwabic in the state of Minnesota in America. I am sending passage and hope you will accept. Sincerely, your uncle, Mr. Anton Kovic, Biwabic, Minnesota, United States of America. Katka folded the letter and handed it back to Paul. Why didn't he mention you? If something happened to me, I would have given the letter to someone else to deliver. Your uncle and I had a tough crossing years ago when I first went to America. It is better now. He convinces her to go to America. Skipping a little here. I don't want to keep you here all day. Chapter 2. Katka's steamer trunk was heavy. She had fastened a leather strap on one end which enabled her to drag the burdensome chest when she could no longer manage to carry it. As for Paul, he had only a small suitcase that seemed weightless under his large hands. At the station in the beautiful city of nearby Ljubljana, they boarded the train that took them to a seaport in Trieste, which was Slovenia. For nearly three hours, they waited on the docks before the captain allowed passengers to board. A small man in a seaman's uniform yelled, all aboard, and the mad dash began. Paul grabbed Katka's trunk in addition to his own small suitcase. Hold on to me, he commanded. Keep up and do not let go. Paul bandied his way through the other passengers as if he were playing a ball game. Katka held fast. He knew where he was going. He joggled his way to the staircase at the back of the ship that led to the sleeping quarters for steerage passengers. He quickly found a berth not far from the staircase where the air was less foul and deposited Katka's trunk on the stained bed. You will sleep here, Paul said. Sit on your mattress and do not let anyone take it from you. If anyone asks, you are traveling alone. Why? I can't explain. Not yet. Let's skip a little. A Slovenian woman shared Katka's sleeping quarters. She had four children. The baby, who was six months old, was surprisingly quiet easily lulled by his mother's capable breasts. The next youngest boy, who looked to be about three, cried constantly on the first day and began vomiting on the second. The two older girls tried, without success, to help their mother calm their brother. Katka could have helped, but instead she tried to make herself invisible. 
She knew the boy was going to die. She could smell it. For weeks, she had done nothing but care for her parents, and what good did it do? They were gone, and she was alone. She would not get attached to this boy, to this mother. Finally, after six days of sickness, the young boy had nothing left to spew. He lay down, rested his head on his mother's chest, and within an hour stopped breathing. Two hours later, the tiny body was thrown overboard. Afterward, Katka's little birth was much quieter. The mother cried. When her tears were gone, she laid stomach down on the scratchy straw, and her shoulders convulsed quietly as if struck with the fits. The baby remained calm as ever. The older girls, eight and six, began to look like old women who carried their sorrow in their dark black eyes. One night, Katka awoke to find Greta, the six-year-old girl standing over her bunk. Do you think the sharks ate Frank? she asked. Katka rose to an upright position. Your brother? Yes, Frank. Katka hesitated. Did someone tell you that? A boy on the deck. He said, children, they have more juice. That's why sharks like them. What kind of boy said that? Italia boy with fat cheeks. That explains it. Italians do have more juice, Katka said slowly. But sharks don't like Slovenians one bit. No fish do. Slovenian children are too skinny. They get whisked up to heaven straight away. I'll skip a little. Katka opened her arms and Greta nestled next to her. She hummed a lullaby, and soon the child was breathing rhythmically. Katka could have let her go. She could have gently carried Greta back to her own birth next to her sister. Instead, she pulled her tight. The child shivered from the draftiness of the boat, and slowly her body temperature rose as it seeped heat from Katka's chest. Moments after her own mother had died, while her dead body still lay on the stained bedsheet, Katka laid her head on her mother's chest one last time and breathed in her smell. The smell of her mother's skin had been soothing. Cabbage and soap made of lemongrass and lavender. As long as this smell survived, she would still have her mother. And if she had her mother, she would have all of Slovenia. A little more on the boat. Okay, so uh, the trip is long. These trips got delayed over and over again. Um, they get into the port. When she first glanced the Statue of Liberty, Katka squeezed Paul's hand. Not in the clear yet, Paul said, pointing. We must now navigate the Island of Tears. Katka thought he was joking, but his face was somber. He was uncharacteristically quiet. The ship reached its port. Once off the ship, they were shuffled into a large brick building. Katka and Paul waited in the baggage area with thousands of other immigrants. On occasion, Paul wandered off, saying he recognized someone from the old country, then returned. After sitting for hours, they were told to stand and wait in a line, which would lead them up the staircase to the great hall. Katka, Paul said, pointing. Do you see that man in the dark uniform? She looked. With the hat, walking up the steps? Yes. Do you see what's in his hand? Look now. He has stopped. He is marking that woman's coat. Katka saw him scribble an initial and circle it. If someone tries to mark your coat, wipe the mark off. As soon as he is out of sight, it is only chalk. If you cannot wipe it off, turn your coat inside out. Yes, Katka said. If you do not have a mark, you should get through quick. He gave her an encouraging half smile. But Kat, it is possible I will get detained here. Detained? Delayed. An immigration officer beckoned the line to move forward. It's time to part. Paul, 
looked at Katka and touched her chin playfully. He paused as if about to speak but thought better of it. What is it, Paul? Do not call me Paul, not here. He looked off in the distance, scanning the crowd. Remember, when they ask you questions, tell them you are traveling alone. I'm a little frightened. You are a tiger in the night. I only pretend to be. I'm a mouse scurrying about in a ramshackle cottage. No, you are a tiger who knows what it is to be a mouse. Chapter three, I'm almost done. <laughs> Paul knew he was in trouble. When he left Katka, he went immediately to the designated place. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn was there, waiting, just as she said she would be. She wore a long black skirt and a white shirt with long sleeves and ruffles up the front. Her large-brimmed purple hat had a pink ribbon. They know you are here, she said. Someone tipped them off. Switch suitcases. He put his suitcase down and picked up hers instead. Good luck. If you don't make it out, we will find another way. Find the guard named Tommy O'Sullivan. He will know the code. Watch that that girl, Katka, gets on the right train, okay? She is going to Chicago, then Duluth, Minnesota. I'll see to it. He tipped his hat to Elizabeth. I'll take that, she said, holding out her hand. He gave her his hat. Your coat? He handed it to her and walked into the crowd. When surrounded by people, he knelt down and opened the suitcase. He found a new coat and hat and quickly put them on. He closed the suitcase, put his hand in the inside pocket, and breathed a sigh of relief. As he stood up, he felt a hand on his shoulder. Turning, he saw a man with a shock of yellow hair wearing a black suit and a white bow tie. I do hope you'll come quietly this time, Mr. Schmidt. We'd hate for you to disappear. The man marked the left sleeve of his coat with the letter A, anarchist. Then he circled the letter. I am a citizen of this country. I have done nothing wrong. Of course you haven't, the agent said. Paul glanced around. In the corner of his eye, he spotted the wide-brimmed purple hat. Elizabeth was watching him. Should he run? As if reading his mind, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn shook her head no. The immigration agent led Paul to a holding room just off the main hall. Inside, several men and a few women shifted uncomfortably on chairs. Everyone had an A. Paul looked around the crowded room. Each person, he imagined, had a story to tell. Although some were socialists, anarchists, revolutionaries, and political agitators, most were naturalized citizens of the United States and some were even born in this country. In New York, there had been several raids in the past few weeks. The police had arrested numerous famous people, one of whom was the Russian immigrant Emma Goldman, an anarchist married to a doctor who treated diseases related to poverty. She was arrested for giving a speech in which she advocated access to birth control. Her speech violated the Comstock law, which prevented the distribution of lascivious literature. She had waited in the same room only days prior. Goldman's arrest was lauded by newspapers across the country. Political writers urged that America weed out new immigrants like Goldman, who were unhappy with the status quo. Since the war erupted, a new ideological movement swept across the land finding favor with members of high society and Congress. Books were published warning against the mongrelization of America, particularly through immigration of people from Eastern Europe, like Kaka and Paul. The books claimed that Eastern European immigrants possessed a higher percentage of socially deviant qualities. New York's mayor read these articles. He listened to his wealthy benefactors. He ordered his police to infiltrate union halls and arrest everyone inside. They also entered taverns in the warehouse districts and textile neighbors and arrested everyone who looked Slavic or Jewish, shipping them off to Ellis Island. Each day, a new group would be shuffled into this room where an inspector would create a file before escorting them to their prison cells. Paul took a seat in the back. How long you been here? Paul asked the man to his left. He 
He was about 50 years old, with a neck the size of an oak tree, and hands like ham hocks. In this room here, about four hours. They ain't no hurry, I'll tell you that much. You don't look like you came off a boat. Came off my shift. I'm a dock worker. When I arrived this morning, there they was with their clubs, told the whole lot of us to load up in the paddy wagon, <coughs> else they'd kill us. What's the reason? Said they heard we was organizing. Were you? Maybe. Nothing bad will happen to me, you'll see. Um, I'll finish this. Years ago, the inhabitants of this room had their fates decided relatively quickly. They were imprisoned for a week, possibly two. Then they would go to trial and a judge would either deport them, release them to a family for observation, or absolve them. In 1906, when Paul first arrived in America, over a million immigrants had entered the country, almost 900,000 through Ellis Island. The building overflowed and the staff was insufficiently equipped. Immigrants with illnesses spilled over from the hospital wards into the detainment quarters. This was not 1906. It was 1915. War had erupted overseas and immigration was severely curtailed. Fewer than 150,000 immigrants would come through Ellis Island this year, and more than 90% would pass through the inspections within hours of arrival. Those who did not pass inspections faced a new kind of destiny. Ellis Island was no longer simply a port of arrival for immigrants. It had become a jail for anyone suspected of anti-American activity. It also housed vagrants and New Yorkers with loathsome communicable diseases. The war made it impossible to deport anyone. Prisoners found themselves living at Ellis Island for years. Paul put his feet up, leaned back, and closed his eyes. He thought about Kapka. Thanks. Um. So just to play historian for a moment and to add a little bit while, while Megan gets her wind, um, I want to recommend a wonderful book that was written by a historian here at the University of Minnesota uh, probably 30 years ago, maybe more, uh, Paul Murphy, uh, a book called World War I and the Origin of Civil Liberties. Um, many of us don't realize that uh, the organization, the American Civil Liberties Union, uh, was only created during World War I. It doesn't have a longer, older history than that. And Murphy even argues that the very concept of civil liberties only began to be articulated during the war out of the kinds of experiences that Megan ended writing about, reading to us, um, about the experiences uh, not only on Ellis Island, but also the experiences that immigrants were having uh, on the Iron Range and that immigrants were having in Minneapolis and St. Paul and really all over the country. So this wave of repression that began during the war and would ultimately lead to the anti-immigrant uh, restriction acts, the Johnson Reed Immigration Acts of 1923-1924. So um, I'm, as a historian, I'm, I'm also now becoming a, someone who appreciates this new literary genre uh, called creative nonfiction. Um, which I think also has some roots here at the University of Minnesota and uh, writers like Sherry Register and Trish Ample. And, um, but the idea that they're, they're really... You, how many of you know who Elizabeth Gurley Flynn was? See, so we're going to have to give a little reference there. Uh, there, there are some real, there are some quote-unquote real historical figures uh, as well as... as uh, figures whose experiences are real, but whose names and uh, personal statistics may not may not show up in the manuscript census. Or um, so we can start to tell tell them who Elizabeth Gurley Flynn is. Um, when I first started doing research for this book, I I knew I I wanted to write a book about Biwabic. Um I spent 20 years finding multicultural literature for my students, and it occurred to me one day that I never ever read a book about a Slovenian. And so I thought, I'm going to write a book about Slovenian Americans, 
and I'm going to have it take place on the Iron Range. And so I started doing some research, and I found this strike. When I started researching the strike of 1916, which I knew about, my dad had certainly given me a, a history lesson that everyone on the range knew a little bit about it. Well, maybe not everyone, that's a fallacy of logic, right? I've got some theory of knowledge kids over there. <laughs> I just taught them no hasty generalizations. <laughs> um, I was astounded by the number of famous people in history who were in Biwabic, Minnesota, on the Iron Range in 1916. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn is one. She was a fantastic women's rights activist, fantastic labor activist. She traveled um, through the range on a bakery cart giving speeches to try to encourage the miners to not cross the picket lines and encourage their wives to support the fact that their husbands were not crossing the picket line, which meant their kids would go hungry. She also uh, later had a fairly prominent role in the Communist Party of the United States of America, which Peter can, can say more about, but she spent a lot of time. Mother Jones, if you know, she was, she was there in 1907. Um, what, a lot of my book is about um, the IWW, the Wobblies, which are, I think are misrepresented throughout history as, as a, a violent group of bandits. They weren't. They were revolutionaries who wanted to change America for the better. Um, they were the first union that embraced African Americans. They were the first union that really, really catered toward women. And they had no problem organizing foreign borns, which is what the Iron Range was. And they were smart about it. So when they started striking, why do people think the Iron Rangers can't be organized? Because they're speaking English to them. So one of the first things that the IWW did is they set up translators. And they would have their meetings, their organizing meetings, and. 12, 14 different languages. And so it, it was very effective that way. It was a group that really wanted to organize the people who believed that although people who own the businesses in the United States of America are entitled to something, they're not entitled to 50 times the salary of the person who does the work. Um, anyway, Elizabeth Gurley Brown was... Um, Gurley Flynn. Elizabeth Gurley Brown is the editor of Cosmo. <laughs> Not to be. <laughs> I was just looking at magazines earlier today. Um, so she was one of the very, very famous people. Um, Frank Little appears in, in the book. He uh, was part Ojibwe, um, part French. Um, Arthur Booth pretty famous, Sam Scarlett, uh, very famous labor activist, Carlo Tresca, all of these people who are dead are in my book. If they were Iron Rangers, their names have been changed. So uh, several times, in fact, because they, when I change them the first time, they're like, Seppala? And you called him Seppanen? No. So he becomes Johan Koski. So there are all kinds of um, famous Iron Rangers too, but all of their names have been changed. <clears throat> so this is very much a labor story as much as it is an immigration story. And uh, I think it's important for us both to be aware of that about the past and, and also to be aware about that in the present. And, uh, you know, what are, as, as you know, Megan has made a passionate appeal, and particularly in talking about her students, uh, to think about the ways that uh, immigrants today are being treated and understood. Um, and I think it's important to be aware of what is the work that immigrants are doing today and who's working in the meatpacking plants, who's working in the vegetable processing plants, who's doing personal care assistant work, taking care of uh, people in their homes, who's working in nursing homes, uh, the tremendous amount of labor. And at, again, I think at the time that Megan is, is evoking for us, um, 
labor that is grossly underpaid, uh, labor that the people performing it are often invisible uh, to, the, to the larger society, that it seems these, these are very important uh, connections for us as we think about um, you know, the theme that Erica started us out with about immigrants past and present, what are the real connections uh, between those past experiences and, and present experiences, and how can we participate in creating a, a conversation between the past and the present that pays attention uh, to these questions, not only of the richness of cultures uh, that people bring with them that are often disrespected and disregarded, but also the labor that they then perform um, when, when they're here. Now, does that, anything you want to say to, to that? Oh, sure. Um, the conditions, I'm just going to go back to this an original topic that I brought up. The, the conditions that the miners faced on the Iron Range were deplorable. They, they asked these men to endure things that even the animals did not endure. And I think oftentimes, if, if you don't consider someone a human being, that's how you can justify saying, we need more money, we have fewer workers coming in, therefore, you, as a dynamite blaster, are going to work without a spotter. Which means that all kinds of lives are in danger. But how important is a life? Whose life is more important? Is an immigrant's life as important as somebody who is not an immigrant? You look at this today, just last week somebody was saying to me, look at these guys working on this garage. I don't know where they were from, possibly Mexico. I don't know. They are great workers. They start at 6 in the morning and they don't quit until 9. And I said, why? They, they like it that way. They like that. They like to work that hard. They like to get the extra hours. No, they're human beings with families. We need to say no. I'm not going to hire these workers and tell them that they get to work for 12 hours, where if I were to hire somebody else, they, they would have some kind of laws saying this is not dignified. This is not human. This is what I'm talking about, about making the connection between the past and the present. Um, thank you, Alexa and Rachel, and I, I've got some students here. Um, not too long ago, we had um, Congressman Keith Ellison come into um, my classroom, and he said something that was really profound. He said, you know, it's easy to stand up and say, I'm against racism. Okay. What's really hard is to say to your mother-in-law, the racist comment you just made is really offensive. I, I don't want you using that kind of terminology around my children. So I think that's a challenge. What can we do? Well, look around. Are there little tiny things that we can do that can change the world? Yes every single day. <clears throat> so, um, it's hard to follow you. <laughs> so, and your, your writing was so, just so beautiful. Uh, so, I, I just want to throw in um, sort of one little historical factoid and, and then maybe we can open things up and see what you're all thinking about it. Um, I can't remember where I, I learned this, but um, I did learn that in the year 1880, a barrel of flour milled right out here uh, on the Minneapolis waterfront and shipped by train to Duluth and then put on an ocean-going ship uh, across Lake Superior, out the St. Lawrence Seaway, across the Atlantic Ocean, that by the time that barrel of flour reached Warsaw, Poland, and was put on sale in Warsaw, Poland, <clears throat> it sold for less than a barrel of flour that had been milled in Warsaw <coughs> out of 
wheat that had been grown in Poland. And when we think about international trade, um, <clears throat> we know that uh, business interests in Minnesota or in the United States would not have been sending product uh, to Poland um, if there wasn't something to put in those ships uh, to come back. And of course what happened in Poland or in Slovenia or Serbia or many other places in southern, central, and eastern Europe is that those farmers who grew wheat could not get a price uh, for their wheat that enabled them to continue to pay the mortgages on their farms. And so some members of their family then, you know, in the case of Katka, she's come because uh, her mother and father have died of disease, but there were other Slovenians and Serbians, Croatians, and many others who decided that an older son or an older daughter or a middle son or um, that they should take that journey across the Atlantic Ocean um, to get a job in the United States uh, and either send money back or send for family members to bring over. And what I found so powerful about that story, and I don't know where your minds are going, but if we thought about corn from, Mex from Minnesota in the 1990s and today, corn being shipped to Mexico, underselling corn that's grown in Mexico, Mexican farmers unable to get a price for their corn that enables them to continue to pay the mortgage uh, on their farms. And so some family members, uh, perhaps women, come to the Maquiladora region and work in factories that are owned by the United States Capitol or multinational capital, or uh, family members get into the United States either uh, legally or without papers um, in order to earn money and send that money back, at least initially, with the strategy of maybe that money that's earned here enables them to pay those mortgages there and that they will someday go back and own their farm rather than be continuously paying the bank. Um, and so it, it is, you know, at 110 years or 120 years, it is the same story. And, uh, and when we enact ways to regulate immigration in the present that doesn't take into account, into account trade, that doesn't take capital into account, that only looks at the human beings, it's easy to say, um, let's build a really high wall uh, on the, I'm, I'm not going to say who said that, that the NEH do they get a copy of this? <laughs> Erica told me not to do this. <laughs> I will stop there. Um, but, uh, but at any rate, um, you know, I think that the parallels in the stories are amazing. And so many of us in our families, we have stories of people who came, quote unquote, in steerage. And, and what that meant was that human beings, that somebody who owned those ships figured out that human bodies are more flexible than barrels of flour. And so you design the hold of the ship to, to contain barrels, and then you ask human beings to bend their bodies and, and squeeze and fit in order to come in those ships and, and, and come back. And it's, it's interesting that in some ways very direct here because uh, Northeast Minneapolis uh, grows after the 1880s precisely by uh, people who are coming uh, from places where they could not maintain their farms and, and that becomes the, the new community of Northeast Minneapolis. But I, I think that, that we see this same story being repeated uh, today and, and if we're sort of, we're waiting for the great novelist the great practitioner of creative nonfiction to tell us that Mexican story as compellingly as, as Megan is telling us the Slovenian story. Um, so what, what's on your minds? And um, you can direct it. And Sang and Brian have microphones so that the NEH can hear what you say, too. Uh, We're not that important. <laughs> 
Let's hope, huh? Let's hope. Thoughts, comments, questions? Yes. I was really glad that uh, the novel was serialized in the newspaper, and I have to say I read it with great excitement, and congratulations. Thanks. <laughs> so on the downside, I, I will say I'm a hard book kind of guy. I like to have a real book in my hands. I don't have a Kindle. Um, and, um, and I continue to wait eagerly uh, for the book to come out in, in paper form um, so that I can take it to bed and, and, and read it and, and so that we can have a copy of it on the shelves at the East Side Freedom Library. And, um, and I will also say that Megan revealed to me that she's about to enter into conversations with the History Theater in St. Paul that are interested perhaps in creating a, a play version of this. And, if you know people at the History Theater, you should email them and call them and encourage them. Last, we want to see this on stage. Um, but I also want to have a good hard copy of it, and, and I'm still waiting for that. Yeah, that, that'll happen. Um, there are just a, a few things that uh, the Star Trip has the rights, and they've got their new serial coming out. So I think they'll hold on to them until um, the new serial comes out, and then I, I'll definitely put it in, in print form. A, a lot of the people who are interested in my book are Iron Rangers over the age of 65 who are never going to read. And there are a lot of Iron Rangers who do read online because we, we don't have as many library resources as we used to. But there are a lot of people who want the book form, and I do too. So I want it probably more than you guys. So it, 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 will, it will definitely happen. You'll be able to hold it in your hand. So. Get it signed. Yes. Well, get it signed. You, you have... First of all, when is that happening? I do not know. Um, I think I can negotiate to get the rights back after the next serial comes out, which will be in May. So I haven't really, I've been not teaching. I've been busy. <laughs> I had a question about the just the whole concept of creative nonfiction and how you decided whether to fictionalize certain characters and why. Yeah. Great. I actually um, consider my novel to be historical fiction. Um, it is based on a true story, and with the exception of Katka and Milo, um, people always say, like, "Oh, that was Milo." It's from Miloslav, which is a Slovenian name. Um, Katka, not Milo, Katka and Paul were totally uh, made up characters. I wanted Katka to be an archetype for Iron Range women. I felt like she was kind of a, a mirror. So when she got to see Baiwabek for the first time, and I wanted to imagine what would it be like to see everything for the first time. But almost all of the other characters were based on, on real people. And I had to honor that as best I could, but I did have a little bit of our artistic license. Um, I ran into some trouble um, because some of my sources were really hard to document. They were human beings that I talked to years ago, 25 years ago, when I worked at the Iron Range Research Center. And I did tons of oral histories. I was like, I was 18 years old. And I was interviewing these people, and they were telling me about the strike. And they were telling me, uh, particularly under contention, is um, in in the book. There there is a, a strategy that was used by corporate America quite regularly to break a strike, and it was to to use people's wives as leverage. So you say, cross the picket line. Or I'm going to sexually assault your wife and children. It's a very common practice. Do you see a whole lot of documentation of this? No. Does that mean it's not true? No. It was true. When I give readings on the range, about half of the talk is people coming up and telling me things. Like, I had these records in my hand. And this doctor told me he had to go in and get rid of any kind of documentation 
that would suggest a sexual assault. So I'm doing research on this. I'm finding tons of people who are saying, yes, this happened, yes, this happened, yes, this happened. And so am I going to not include this in my book? No, of course I'm going to include it in my book. But it is a slippery slope. It, what do I do? What I tried to do, and this was my moral compass, was I wanted to tell the truth as I saw it based on the people who told me stories and I believed their truth. And sometimes I didn't have the documentation, and so I took it out. And sometimes I didn't have the documentation, and I kept it in. And so that, that can, be, can be problematic. A lot of the violence, uh, I was criticized for the making it more violent than it really was. Well, you go up to the Iron Range, and the comments are exactly the opposite. They're like, you did not cover this violence at all. You did not go anywhere near how violent this strike was. And you look at the records, and the records say three people died in the strike. This was a nonviolent strike. This was not a nonviolent strike. This was a brutally violent strike, where women and children were used as leverage. So it, it's a very different story from the people who tell it. Here's the thing. There aren't very many fiction books written about this strike. There are nonfiction books. I read tons of them. Not enough, but I read tons of them. These stories are there. When I go up north, people are dying to tell, tell them. The last time I was there, there, there was a, a man, Bobby Sherrick. His dad, somebody just went home, because if you're an Iron Ranger, you know all these names. You're like, oh, I know Bobby. <laughs> and in fact, the first draft of my book, like, you'd be like, oh, okay, that's I, that's so-and-so's cousin. You know everybody. All the names are the same. But his criticism was valid. He said, I wish you would have talked a little bit more about the people who crossed the line. Because my dad crossed the line. He took it to his grave. It was, it was a horrible experience for him. And Bobby Sherrick said to me, so are you saying that it was not courageous for my father to say, I'm going to cross the line so that my wife doesn't get abused? Isn't that courageous? Are you saying that he was not as good of a man as the people who refused to cross the line? These are tough questions. He also told me stories about what they did to the people who crossed the line, that they would dig these ditches. And they'd go out in the middle of the woods, and if you're from Biwabic, that area, the woods are thick. And they would take them out, they would blindfold them, and they would line them up execution ring and then they would push them in. They didn't shoot them. They'd push them in and leave them there. All the animals. So, talking about historical accuracy, <clears throat> there are a lot of stories I did not put in there. There are a lot of stories that I... I there's no documentation of this. But I still want to tell the story. If we only told the stories that were documented, we would be doing a, an injustice to, to the people we love who lived these truths. So I thought about it long and hard. And I made decisions. Maybe I didn't always make the right one, but I did think about them. So, so earlier tonight I was talking with <laughs> Brian about the British historian Edward Thompson and, um, and Thompson, who I was fortunate to study with, told us a story at the beginning of a history course. He said, you know, I, I want to tell you about the very well-known British historian, Sidney and Beatrice Webb. He said, here is how the Webbs wrote their books. They, first, they would have 
graduate students to do research for them. And they would figure out how to formulate questions that would have yes or no answers. And they would have the graduate students do research and compile information on index cards. And they would create two piles, the yes pile and the no pile. And then whichever pile was larger they used for the book and whichever pile was smaller they threw away. And so it was his way to, to let us know that writing a history book was not necessarily any more objective or scientific than, than, than writing a novel. And uh, that, that one stuck with me. Um, please. Uh, first comment, Megan, did you know the Boom Boom Room in Biwabic? Well, yes, I did, but not in the way you think. <laughs> I was in college when that was going in its peak. I grew up in the Zim and rural Iron Range. Uh, a lot of the Finns, well, Finnish <coughs> I grew up with, uh, my grandfather was one of the castoffs uh, who did not want to join the company town, the company this and the company that. And they ended up on the little two-bit farms out in the, out in the bogs. And uh, I did not know until I came to the university that uh, I'm entirely of Finnish ancestry. I grew up a co-op Finn, it turns out. My brother married into the church Finns. And there were some other people that we didn't really associate with. The story is my father borrowed Gus Hall's white suit when he was a young man, because he didn't have one. Thank you. That, that's so interesting. Uh, the Finns are fascinating. I had somebody write me a letter and say, why don't you write this from the perspective of a Finnish pro protagonist? <laughs> I'm like, somebody should do that. Mark Munger has, uh, you probably know him very well, but uh, he spoke to our group uh, two weeks ago, and he started researching the Finns because he found out there were these three blacks that were hanged in Duluth, and there's very little written about them. And in researching this, he found out about a Finn who was tarred and hanged. Mm -hmm. And he said, I've never heard about this. And he's a district court judge. <clears throat> and so then he started delving into this. And uh, you know, it's just fascinating. Yeah, it's it is. <clears throat> no, I, I, it opened, your comments open up a, a question that we've been talking about in terms of this uh, whole series, which is how do we deal with race? Um, and, and how do we deal with the uh, experiences of indigenous people uh, who were pushed out, in some cases exterminated, in other cases dislocated and relocated, um, and then we get the stories of the powerful white people and the new immigrants who fight it out in a space that, that had once been native space and how do we understand that and how do we understand the consequences of some of that and one of the really interesting things about uh fins and how fins were viewed uh on the iron range that's my phone oh that's <laughs> embarrassing <laughs> I shot I, yeah I oh, thought i'd put uh, it out there so yeah okay anyways. and uh, the duluth the duluth newspaper referred to the Finns over and over as uh, Jack Pine savages. And so there was a way that, that, that the stereotypes of you know, what were the uncivilized indigenous people who deserved to be pushed out because they were uncivilized. Uh, and then in come these immigrants who uh, organize unions and go on strike and cause trouble with their employers they look pretty uncivilized from the point of view of the Duluth newspaper or corporate employers. And, and so the stereotypes get collapsed and fins are presented as these the words that are used of jack pine savages. Um, so, uh, and, and then in, in terms of the Duluth lynching, um, one of the things that a student of mine, McAllister, discovered in, in doing research um, was that in the crowd, when those three young men were lynched in, in the summer of 1921, was an eight-year-old boy, Jewish boy from Ukraine, who had been brought by his family fleeing a pogrom. And, and this would be Bob Dylan's father, 
as an eight-year-old having just arrived in Duluth. And so think about the term pogrom, and, and we live in an era where people fight about language now in very interesting ways. You know, should we think about race riots as a kind of pogrom? And which ones and why? And that, that here's this young boy and his family who have just arrived fleeing the Cossacks, fleeing the mob, and they find themselves in Duluth and suddenly there they are in a mob. And, and how do they understand that? And, um, and, and in one of Dylan's songs, he actually begins with the line, um, they're selling postcards of the hanging. And, and in fact, there were postcards made of the, of the three bodies in Duluth, and they were sent through the mail. And, um, and we don't know if any of you get a chance to talk with Mr. Dylan. You know, ask him, when did Dad tell him that story? And, and in what circumstances, and I would love to know that. But so how these racialized images enter into um, the identities and imaginations and of, of how, do, how do these immigrants, whether they become Iron Rangers or identify as being half this or one quarter that, you know, where, where does also identifying as white as opposed to black or white, as opposed to native, how 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 are those identities forged? And I think we still don't know a lot about that. And I think that that that's an important part of this conversation between the past and the present that I hope we're going to have over the next year. Yeah. Kind of to bridge that, um, I was thinking um, about your comment. My parents are Iron Rangers, and I have always grown up saying. I'm an Italian Finnish, like I'm half Italian, half Finnish. You know, that's, I've always thought that, and I thought everyone kind of did that until I started realizing that everyone did. <laughs> and so I was wondering if through your research you have come across when do people lose that immigrants today? Like, at what is there a generational thing? Like, at what point do people stop saying I'm Finnish Italian or? you know, that they don't connect to their culture and that, that culture and race isn't as predominant and suddenly it's, you know, we're all against the other. Have you noticed any? There was um, a, a great movement on, on the Iron Range to suppress that. So, and this of course has happened across the nation, but for example, um, my dad had to wear a button when he was a kid that says, I speak English only. He had to wear it every day in Ely in school. And all of the kids who didn't have English as their first language, most of, our, most of you who are here, our parents, did not have English as a first language, um, at least when they were growing up. But they were really taught to be American and not be Slovenian or not be Finnish or whatever, I mean, there, it, it was, it wasn't just random, it was calculated. And then the parents would say, yes, I want you to speak without an accent. This goes back to what I was saying. I don't have an accent, so I enjoy all of the advantages of white privilege. And so here you have these um, people who have come from other countries, they have accents, they are discriminated against. And so when they are told, don't teach your children Slovenian, don't teach your children the language that you, you speak to your husband every single day, they listen because they see that there are advantages to not being viewed as a new American. So I think it started, but I attest this with absolutely zero proof, except for the people in this room, I think that people on the Iron Range hold on to that a lot longer. Um, can anybody, can, do I have a witness? It just seems like when you're an Iron Ranger, you're always an Iron Ranger if you grew up there. Like, and you're always going to be whatever your ethnicity is that, that you were brought up. But if you don't, I, I think it's more where you're born. Like. I, I think if you're not born on the Iron Range, then, then it's, it's easier for you to, to not do that because you're not surrounded by people all the time who are using 
the language of our people, which is patitza. Okay? Sauna. 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 <laughs> tennis. We don't say tennis shoes, we say tenors. Okay? I mean, we have an entire language that that is ours. And when you're in that language, I think you're more likely to actually hold on to some of the other values as well. I'm just postulating. Did you want to say something? Oh, I think you had your hand up. I do that all the time. So let, let me add another book that was written here at the University of Minnesota uh, by David Rodiger uh, called Working Towards Whiteness, uh, How European Ethnics Became White. Uh, I think it's a, a, and it's not as specific as the range, and and I think there are even books about how to speak range, and you know, so so there, there may be something particular, but David's is more of a national uh, look, and I also think that um, that we have a real tendency to, I think it's inescapable to look backwards from from where we are. And, and we're in a place that is post-ethnic revival. It was something that Rudy Vicoli, who started the Immigration History Research Center, was very, very aware of. That uh, sort of after roots, there was quite a move here in the United States by third and fourth generation European Americans to reclaim their ethnic identity. Kiss me, I'm Irish. Uh, if, if we look at the popularity of the Festival of Nations uh, in St. Paul, it skyrockets up uh, in the 1970s. Um, that some of it is a response to black is beautiful, right? If black people think they're beautiful, well then Italian people and Irish people, and we all should be recognize that we're beautiful too. And, and I think there's been so much of that in our childhoods or uh, in our lifetimes that to, to, to look back, you know, that, that we have to filter our way through. Um, today, I, I had this amazing conversation today with a priest at uh, Trinity Orthodox Church in, in our neighborhood on the east side of St. Paul who said that one of the things that he had to deal with when he took over the church in 1990, and it had been founded in 1916 as a Serbian Orthodox church, or they said, well, it was mixed, it was Bielorussian and Serbian. And, uh, and you gotta hang out at the IHRC to even know what is a Bielorussian, um, and how that's different from a Carpatho-Rusin, and some very specific stuff. But, he said the thing that he would struggle with, he took over the church in 1990, and the thing that he found the hardest was that they had this gigantic American flag affixed to the altar. And he said, you know, that wasn't in seminary, you know, where he learned to be an Orthodox priest. And, and he said this was, that he realized that this was a response to the power of the Cold War and anti-communism in the United States that many Eastern Europeans went the extra mile to demonstrate that they were patriotic and, and loyal Americans. And so, you know, there, there are many things that factor into this, um, whether people embrace those ethnic identities and, or, or, you know, or how we think about them as constantly being reinvented. And they're not reinvented out of whole cloth. There are materials, but they are being reinvented in the present as ways of understanding the journey that we've taken to, to get where we are. Please, in, in the back. Oh, I, um, my mother, um, my mother's from Chisholm, Minnesota, and I'm um, half Serbian. I even have a little a little pendant that says 50% Serbian. Uh -huh. <laughs> so um, whoever designed that must, must be from there. <laughs> Anyway, um, but all of the Eastern Orthodox, like Eastern European, not Greek, not Greek, have American flags. I don't think I've ever been in one that did not have a flag, maybe not on the altar. And and, and, and I know Father Jonathan too. Um, we had a lot of good discussions, but um, Greek churches not so much with the flag. Um, but and then my husband is um, Ukrainian. My 
mother-in-laws from Ukraine, and at their church, they uh, the liturgy is in English on alternating Sundays, and on the English-speaking Sunday at the end of liturgy, they also sing "God Bless America," which that's that I've never experienced before in an Orthodox church, but that's what they do. So. Well, I, I, I don't know how many of you have had the pleasure of patronizing this not product placement, but uh, Moscow on the Hill, uh, and in the summer they have a, a, a patio space in back, and we, we were there one night and there was a singer, and someone, not me, uh, but someone requested the Internazionale, and she, she sang the Internazionale, and she immediately followed it with the Ukrainian National Anthem. You know, just so, you know, that we were clear. Uh, so, you know, I, I think these, that, that these identities are both cultural and political, um, and the political winds change. So it isn't only about generations getting older, uh, or new generations being born that see new kinds of opportunity. But it's also about what the political climate is in, in the United States. And I mean, in these stories about the American flags and the churches, you know, also suggest to us ways that people still felt at risk. You know, that, that there was something still dangerous about, they were still an outsider, enough of an outsider that they could get in trouble. And, and I think for some of us, that's not an experience that we've had. And for others of us, it's an experience that we've always lived with. And I think it's an interesting framework to think about when we think about newcomers who have come from Burma, have come from uh, Thailand, have come from Laos, have come from Mexico, Somalia. You know, how, do they, how are they positioning themselves in terms of the political winds uh, that, that blow both through this country and their countries, and it's really complicated, all of that. Erica, please. <laughs> I have two things um, for consideration, and, um, and then perhaps the last question yeah, about the yeah. novel. So the two things for consideration um, are about the embrace or non-embrace of ethnic identity, and um, thinking about how for some groups, sort of leading up to what you mm -hmm. were just saying, for some groups there is not a choice to be mm -hmm. not seen as ethnic or something different, right. even generations long past since immigration, right? And the other um, thing that I, I wanted to pose for consideration is how, how unique is the Iron Range? You know, can we yeah. think of other pockets around the country where there has been such a great mix of peoples, Lower East Side, of New York City, Los Angeles, where it's not <clears throat> perhaps the same mix of mm -hmm. Finn and Slovenian, but maybe mm -hmm. Italian, Irish, mm -hmm. Polish, right, or Salvadoran, Nicaraguan. Um, so, you know, could could the Iron Range um, be sort of a template mm -hmm. for what is going on today and other and, and what has been going on in other places? Yeah. Um, and then the last the question that I had was. Um, if Megan, if you could talk more about the intersections that you see um, and that you wrote about between the labor movement and the activism um, and also the burgeoning women's rights movement. Mm -hmm. So the fact that Katka and her aunt are, are, you know, literally underground putting forward this amazing newspaper that's just for women and is really advocating some pretty um, revolutionary kind of ideas and, and how how you know the movement to unionize helped to inspire other movements for um, for liberation across other groups. I I know what this is done at eight thirty and I never want to hold anybody one minute past time. I find that as a teacher they hate you. <laughs> um, a lot of the talks I give are about women, um, the role of women in this labor strike. When I read about labor history, it's mostly from the perspective of males. Mm -hmm. And when I decided to choose this, the strike, I thought, I want to write about the woman's perspective. What was it like to be a woman in that house and have no income coming in? Not like you had a great income coming in before, but to have no income coming in. 
So I did research and found that the women on the Iron Range were not unusual. They were incredibly active in this strike. In almost every newspaper article that I read, they were talking about what the women were doing. Um, sometimes they were throwing rotten eggs. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of this was documented in the newspaper, what, what the women were doing. I think they might have been inspired by the women, in, by the Mexican women on the border who were active prior to the Iron Range women and the women in, in New York, the Jewish women. So I think when the Wobblies came, they said, look, women are active. You can be active in this strike. Here are some things that other, other women have done. In my book, the women end up taking over the strike. Why? Because they set the same rule wherever people are organizing. They say if there's strike going on, four union members cannot band together or they will all be arrested or shot. Well, the women aren't union members. So in one way, it, it's a tactic. That's how the strike lasted as long as it did. The women took over. And I think that they are underrepresented. Um, what the women's role is, just because you're not working there doesn't mean you're not supporting the strike. It never would have lasted as long as it did without the support of the women. And I, I talk very extensively about women in, in labor and um, I'll be happy to share some of those places where I do that, but it's it's a really long conversation and in one of the, the goals of my book. But I want to thank you so much for coming. Usually uh, everyone in my audience knows me or someone I'm related to, so it was nice to see new faces. <laughs> um, thank you very much. And thank you.